Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. As we continue our discussion of Jeffersonian America, we now start to move toward the end of that period when, for a handful of years, the United States enjoyed what has come to be called as the Era of Good Feelings, a break in the political rancor that characterized most of Jeffersonian America. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about that period known as the Era of Good Feelings. Now I want to start by showing you again this map that I showed in the previous lecture as well, just indicating the state of growth in the United States during this period. So as we begin our discussion of the Era of Good Feelings, understand that this is a time that comes after the War of 1812, when we are more or less at peace. Uh, there is still some potential conflict uh, brewing with the Spanish. Uh, and we will talk about that. But for the most part, we are free from major foreign threats. The nation is growing. The population is growing and spreading out to the West. Uh, for a time anyway, there is economic prosperity. And we're going to talk about all of these qualities and others that define the so-called era of good feelings. So while many Americans celebrated the victory in the War of 1812, I would note that not everyone was happy about it. Federalists in New England convened at the Hartford Convention in Hartford, Connecticut to protest the War of 1812. For New England, this didn't represent what they had wanted. Recall that they were really struggling uh, with the economic embargo and so on at the beginning of the war. And they felt that their needs and influence had been overshadowed during that war. So they sought to increase the power of New England in the Union. Uh, they wanted to require a two-thirds majority for commercial regulations, declarations of war, and the admission of new states. They also sought the repeal of the Three-Fifths Compromise. Now we've talked in previous lectures about the Federalist influence declining during the Jefferson and Madison era. And the Hartford Convention really kind of showed this last strand of Federalists to be out of step with the rest of the country that felt themselves victorious and in a good mood after the War of 1812. And so these grumpy New England Federalists were kind of the last vestige of that political party, which by the mid-18-teens is really drifting almost into oblivion. In the aftermath of the War of 1812, James Madison recognized the need for a stronger national military and stronger national defense, and also a stronger national economy in the form of a national bank and protective tariffs for American industry. And so part of the reason that we think the Federalist Party declined during this era is that the Republicans were co-opting many of their cornerstone beliefs. And if we think about that, Madison, by 1815 or so, is st starting to sound a lot like Alexander Hamilton at the beginning of the nation's founding. He also talked about the need for improved transportation, better roads and bridges, uh, which I mentioned at the end of the last lecture. And we also begin to see, after the War of 1812, more of a national perspective um, creeping into things, rather than so much emphasis on the individual states and states' rights, which was such a prominent part of the conversation early in our nation's history. But it is really during the presidency of James Monroe, and James Monroe is actually pictured here, this fellow over here is John Quincy Adams, James Monroe's Secretary of State, who may be one of the most frightening looking politicians in all of American history. But for just a moment, let's focus on the man who was president, James Monroe. He is elected in 1816, and it's under Monroe that we really entered this period that some have called the era of good feelings. As the Federalists essentially faded into oblivion, and many of their views had been adopted by Republicans for a brief period. There really is not as much reason for partisan bickering. The two parties have almost morphed into one, which at this point is the Republican Party. 
Now, in one of his wisest moves, James Monroe appointed the Federalist John Quincy Adams, who was the son of John Adams, as his Secretary of State. He also appointed people from different regions as members of his cabinet. And so, once again, the kind of regional and partisan rancor was uh, diminished in Washington during this time. Monroe also took a tour of the country, um, speaking in Boston and traveling up and down the seaboard, um, spreading word about his presidency and ushering in this era, sometimes known as the era of good feelings. Monroe also bridges the divide between generations. He is the last of our presidents with significant ties to the revolutionary generation. And he still had some 18th century sensibilities in his mannerisms, the ways he dressed, and so on. But after Monroe, we literally are moving into a new century and a new age. And so Monroe really bridges this divide between the generations. John Quincy Adams, the Secretary of State, has to be regarded as one of the strongest Secretaries of State in our nation's history, certainly in this early period. He rattled off a string of successes and uh, positive policies that helped to stabilize and normalize our global relations for decades to come. First of all, in the remaining sort of squabbles that carried on between Britain and the United States in the form of various disputes around the Canadian border, um, John Quincy Adams helped to secure treaties that stabilized those relations, setting the boundary between the Louisiana Territory and Canada at the 49th parallel, securing American fishing rights on both coasts, and resolving conflict between the Americans and the British that had persisted on the Great Lakes. He also secured significant victories related to relations with Spain, who controlled Florida and much of the Southwest. In March of 1818, Andrew Jackson led a raid into Spanish Florida to attack the Seminoles. With this aggression into Florida, the prospect with, of war with Spain loomed but rather than going to war, Spain, which was on the decline and had been seeing its empire declining for decades, Spain ceded all claims to Florida and recognized American sovereignty in Louisiana in a treaty called the adams onis Treaty of 1819. And Spain was related to one of the other diplomatic victories of this era. As Spain's empire crumbled, and more and more colonies achieved their own independence, the United States and Britain both moved into the void. And this was the case in 1823, when Britain sent a proposal to the United States that they said that neither one intended to annex the newly liberated states in Spanish America. In response to this British proposal, John Quincy Adams instead urged James Monroe, and Monroe uh, followed his advice, to issue what is known as the Monroe Doctrine in 1823. The Monroe Doctrine, in essence, said that the United States will not intervene or meddle in European affairs, but also warned European powers not to intervene in American affairs and essentially in this hemisphere. So they rejected Britain's proposal uh, about neither side intervening in uh, Span former Spanish colonies. For a relatively young nation, this is a powerful statement of independence and rejection of the former uh, controller of these colonies, Britain. And so the United States is forging ahead and becoming a more respectable and more powerful nation. The presidency of James Monroe was also a period of great technological innovation, in part spurred on by the War of 1812 and the embargo related to it. The United States had to rely more uh, from within for technology and uh, inventions and machinery. 
And so we saw uh, a spark in the evolution of many inventions. In the realm of firearms and weapons, clearly war uh, always serves to spur development in that direction. But uh, it's in this period in the 1820s that gun manufacturers first initiated ideas like interchangeable parts and mass production. Another invention that swept across the country in this period was the cotton gin, invented by Eli Whitney in 1794 and able to remove the seeds from short staple cotton. This invention was uh, created in 1794 but becoming widespread by the 18 teens. And we're going to talk more about the cotton gin and its influence when we get to future lectures about slavery. Also in the 1790s, mills are beginning to become more commonplace, particularly in New England and the Northeast. And so the country is enjoying a period of invention and economic prosperity in this era of good feelings. Finally, we also see in this period a surge in judicial nationalism, the kind of last vestiges of the Federalists lingering on the Supreme Court and other courts exerting their influence. There were a number of prominent cases decided during this period, among the most famous being McCullough versus Maryland. In this case, the state of Maryland had levied a tax on the Baltimore branch of the Second Bank of the United States. Some continued to view the National Bank as a, a final vestige of Hamilton's federalism. But Supreme Court Justice John Marshall declared the Maryland state tax unconstitutional and affirmed the legitimacy and constitutionality of the National Bank. Further, Marshall claimed that the power to tax equaled the power to destroy, and so allowing a state to tax a federally um, chartered bank would have allowed the state of Maryland to undermine the federal government itself. Now, some viewed this decision as federal overreach and sort of a confirmation of their worst fears about Hamilton's view of federalism. Nonetheless, this continued to strengthen the authority and power of the national government. In another, another decision, Gibbons v. Ogden in 1824, the Supreme Court decided on the scope of federal powers over interstate commerce. This was a case involving steamboats, which carried goods up and down uh, rivers and across state lines. In this decision, Marshall and the court confirmed federal authority to regulate interstate commerce and in fact extended that authority to within state lines when commerce was intermingled with economic activity that crossed state lines. And this is uh, an important power that persists with the federal government today to regulate interstate commerce.